Hi, I'm I'm John. Uh, for the people in the back, can you can you hear me pretty well with the with this one? Good. All right, thumbs up. All right, awesome. Uh, what's it? What do you? This is a self portrait. <laughs> um, in my mind, that's how I look. Uh, so uh, before we begin, I want to do a quick overview of how SSL works. So I drew this network diagram. Um, on the left, you have a, a client system. On the right, you have a server. And in the middle, you have your network monitoring solution. Uh, so traditionally, one would think that uh, with that network monitoring solution, all it would see is a source IP, a dest IP, and in the middle, a uh, you know it's encrypted. So that's, that's all you get. Um, uh, but there's actually a lot more that we can uh, we can see uh, uh, with the SSL session that's uh, unencrypted. So first, in the beginning, uh, the client sends a send. Server responds send ACK. Client responds ACK. After immediately after the TCP three-way handshake, the client will send a SSL hello hello packet saying hi. I'd like to talk in SSL. Um, and if the server is listening on SSL, it'll respond with its hello packet uh, followed by X509 subject and an issuer, which is also uh, sent in clear text. Now, the, the X509 um, uh, cert details can be used for, um, for as, as artifacts for detection. Um, so this is where X509 certificate details live in the Pyramid of Pain. Um, you know, the things at the top are uh, harder for threat actors to change and, and even harder to detect. Uh, and the things at the bottom are easy to change and very easy to detect, right? So it's in the middle. Um, so I want to I want to tell you guys a little story about uh, uh, my experience trying to uh, build detection for uh, for certificates um, and uh, my tool of choice for like playing around with and building these detection mechanisms has been Metasploit because Metasploit randomly generates its TLS certs and a lot of tools use them like um, uh, like the uh, you know the trusted sec tool so um, so for you know uh, Originally, this is what the Metasploit randomly generated SSL cert looked like years ago. Uh, it was completely randomly generated. The code that they were using to generate it hard-coded country code to US, and then it randomly created um, some mixed text uh, uh, for the L and O field in the certificate, and another example clearly randomly generated. So how could we detect that? Um, I wanted to build some regex for that uh, mixed case alpha, uh, and I came up with a really complicated string, but then I realized that I could just do this. And that's because the L field in a certificate is supposed to be the location, the city name. Because they hard-coded country code to US, that has to be a US city name. Well, US city name has a lowercase character followed by two or more uppercase characters. The only one I could think of was Washington, DC, but you add that to a whitelist, and so detection was really easy. Um, I gave a talk about this at Nova Hackers uh, a couple years ago, and um, immediately following that talk, uh, this guy, HDM, uh, made a change to how Metasploit was randomly generating its certs. He wanted to change it so that it would look a lot like the snake oil certificate from Ubuntu 14.04. So I was like, all right, HD so-called M, <laughs> let's do this. So. Uh, uh, so this is his code, and it's it's, it's beautiful code. Um, and uh, this is what the certificate looked like. Um, you know, subject and issuer, uh, very simple and small, just CN equals, and then some lowercase characters, and then the certificate alg algorithm was SHA-256. Um, but remember, he wanted to emulate the snake oil certificate of Ubuntu. Um, and so most of the items were the same. However, the snake oil cert did um, certificate algorithms in SHA-1, whereas the Metasploit cert did SHA-256, you know, that's what he gets for trying to be secure, I guess. Uh, and then the uh, the CN for the snake oil cert was hostname.domain, uppercase characters. And the Metasploit cert was just uh, two to 10 characters, uh, lowercase alpha. So detection actually turned out to be really easy there. And that worked for a little bit. However, it was changed again. Our, our Whitcroft uh, last October um, made a change to how it was generating certs, and this is what it looked like. Um, and you could detect it with this regex string. However, it was shortly changed again, 20 days later. Uh, and then they introduced some code, some bug uh, that caused it to do C equals new line, C equals US. Um, and so that was actually really easy to detect. But of course, it changed again. And uh, you could use this regex maybe. But at this point, I was like, <laughs> so how? How can we get to the point where, uh, where we can move up one level on the pyramid of pain? Go from artifacts to tools. 
Uh, and it turns out that you could do this uh, by looking at that client, that SSL client hello packet. And if this sounds familiar uh, to some of you, uh, it's because it is. Uh, Using that method of looking at the client hello packet is, is not new. Um, so Ivan uh, discovered back in 2009 that that he could uh, detect a Google bot and fingerprint Google bot based on the four ciphers that it used in his client hello at the time. Um, but the person who did the most research on this uh, was Lee Brotherston, uh, who released fingerprint TLS at DerbyCon 2015. Um, and this got a lot of people excited, myself included. So we wanted to deploy fingerprint TLS so bad in our network. However, we just couldn't. It was a, it was a standalone tool and, uh, deploying new standalone tools in our environment, uh, is, is kind of difficult. So, um, so luckily at the end of his talk, he said, you know, like, here's my research. Go make it better. Fork my repo. Build something new. You know, uh, take it from there. And so, uh, so, uh, you know, we, we basically did. We sought out to create a, uh, a new fingerprinting uh, method that could work, and so we set our requirements. Uh, it needed to work on our existing tools, the tools that are already deployed in our environment. Um, it needed to, uh, fingerprint needed to be unique to a client application, just like fingerprint TLS. It needed to be easy to create, easy to share, and easy to consume by any tool. Basically, we just wanted it to be really simple. Um, and, uh, and so let's go over how it works. So uh, this is a TLS client hello packet. Um, I got two examples here, one on the left, one on the right, two different clients. They look the same, however, if you, if you look here, uh, the one on the left supports 13 cipher suites, the one on the right, 19. Uh, the one on the left has an extension length of 124, the one on the right, 141. So it looks similar, but they're actually very different. Uh, so Microsoft Edge Browser, for example, 19 cipher suites, extension length 107. Drydex malware, a banking trojan, uh, 21 cipher suites, uh, fewer extensions though. Um, and then TrickBot malware, 12 cipher suites and even fewer extensions. Uh, Microsoft Edge browser, uh, uh, orders its ciphers from, uh, most secure to least secure, right? That makes sense. Uh, but the TrickBot malware just kind of throws them all in there, uh, in random order. So that's odd. Uh, so we can fingerprint TLS clients based on the TLS version. Uh, the cipher suites and the order in which they appear, uh, the extensions and the order in which they appear, and then for added complexity, uh, elliptic curves and elliptic curve point formats. Uh, so this is how it works. This is our, our method for it anyways. We take the version, uh, followed by the ciphers and the order in which they appear, then the extensions and the order in which they appear, and the elliptic curves and the order in which they appear, and the elliptic curve point formats. And so if there's, if there's no more, like there's only one elliptic curve point format in this example, then there's just no delimiters afterwards. We MD5 hash that, and that's our fingerprint. Um, and then if there's, uh, if there's no extensions or elliptic curve for whatever reason, then, uh, the common delimiter persists. Uh, and the reason why we MD5 hash it is because there could be up to 300 supported ciphers, so the, the fingerprint could be huge, and our rule of thumb is that if we can't tweet a fingerprint, then it's too long, so we MD5 hash it to a nice, predictable 32-character fingerprint. Uh, so some examples, Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, uh, Tor Client, Drydex Malware, these are the fingerprints, TrickBot Malware. Um, it works really well. Uh, and if you're wondering, does this work on TLS 1.3? The answer is yes. Uh, here's two different clients talking over TLS 1.3, and you can see that uh, the cipher suites are different, and the order in which they put their uh, extensions is completely different. So fingerprinting still works in TLS 1.3. And, uh, and again, this is uh, the client hello packet comes before the server hello packet. So even if the server's not listening, let's say it's a command and control server and it's just not configured yet, but the client reached out to it, we've already fingerprinted it. So it doesn't matter if the server responds or the SSL session completes or anything like that. We've already got the fingerprint. We already know it's running. Um, so yeah, JAW 3 is up there on the tools uh, level of the pyramid of pain, which is cool. We're move, moving up. Um, and uh, it's open source. There's the GitHub. Uh, if you want the Python version, you can pip install PyJaw3. If you're running Bro, you can just simply run Bro package install Jaw3. And it was created by John Althaus, Jeff Atkinson, and Josh Atkins. And again, I want to make this perfectly clear. Uh, the concept came from Lee Brotherston and his talk here at DerbyCon three years ago. If it wasn't for him doing that talk, this tool would not have existed. 
Um, everything's based on his research, so I want to give like full credit to him. Um, so uh, what are some things that you might want to do with this? Uh, well, the first thing we wanted to do was start mapping um, Jotharista client applications. Uh, so uh, uh, we posted uh, some lists uh, on our GitHub there. Uh, ooh. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is one of the lists that we created, and uh, and uh, Trizzle NSM they created a module that would take Lee Brotherston's fingerprints and convert them into Jaw three. So that list is also available. Uh, we linked to it in our uh, in our GitHub page. Um, but here's an example, and this is really awesome because this is this laptop right here. Um, uh, based on my usage over some period of time. And this is exactly correct. This is what's running on my laptop. I'm basically just using Google Chrome, and then you have some Apple WebKit networking, which would indicate that this is a Mac, and it is. Um, and then there's a blank one there. Ignore that. That's an internal tool. Uh, but this works. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then, so what about a large example network? So uh, something with like uh, 50,000 hosts in it or something like that. Uh, it, it still works. It works really well. So we can see that um, in this example network that Google Chrome is the most prolific application using TLS, uh, and that's accurate. And then way down there at 2.8%, uh, we still have some true believers using Firefox. So, you know. That's good. Uh, what if we dive into a specific domain, like uh, my PC Master Race brethren, right? Uh, so we could see that most connections to steampower.com are using Steam over OSX. Um, and, uh, uh, and I guess some people are connecting over Chrome and Firefox, maybe use a Steam sale that day. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. So uh, you might want to drop. Um, uh, some malware into sandboxes to try to pull out the Jaw 3 fingerprint for that malware. Um, but it's important to baseline your sandbox before you do that because there are operating system APIs uh, that programs can communicate through, and including malware. Um, so uh, this guy, uh, Barford, uh, created just this basic application that would create a bunch of connections um, uh, through all of those operating system APIs. So you could drop that into your sandbox baseline. Any Jaw 3 that you see that's not one of these, you could probably assume is the malware. So file exfil detection over TLS. Uh, this concept was uh, created by uh, Bob Brodstead at Reservoir Labs. Um, basically, the concept of file exfil detection, normal outbound traffic looks like this. Um, uh, a file transfer outbound looks like this, right? So pretty obvious. And so his detection mechanism was just threshold uh, bytes over time, and then log at the end after it drops off. Pretty simple. And so we, you know, we use this, and uh, we have uh, uh, logs that output kind of similar to this. So, um, you know, here's a, a exfil to Dropbox makes sense. And if you add in Jaw three, you could say that the client application was Dropbox. Okay, maybe that's fine. Uh, but what if the client application was PowerShell? Huh? Maybe that's something worth looking into. Um, uh, another example, hunting on weird search subjects. So uh, these search subjects look like DGAs, and they are, right? So uh, if we pivot on them, grab the Jaw 3 that's connecting to that, uh, then we can see a, uh, uh, a list of all of the um, domains that it's connecting to. So uh, that just makes it really easy. Before, with DGAs, people would like try to get the algorithm and have it uh, uh, run through the algorithm and build a database of all different potential domains. And with this, you can just grab the Jaw 3 and just watch that, and it's, it's kind of awesome. Um, Evil Gen X uh, is a man in the middle proxy. Um, so it's supposed to steal your, uh, you know, your cookies or your, your passwords and whatnot. Um, and it's written in Go, and so there's the, uh, the Jaw 3 for that. Now, however, this is the Jaw 3 for Go. So, um, so if you were trying to detect on this, then what you would be detecting is the Go, uh, the Go client. However, if you wanted to detect um, connections to a server that you controlled, where you could see the user agent and everything like that. So let's think that you have a, uh, a server that, um, you know, some critical server, and you wanted to be able to detect anytime someone was having those credentials uh, uh, stolen, right? 
what you could do is you could look for the job three of the Go client, but then also compare that to the user agent. And if the user agent is Chrome and the job three is a Go client, then you can kind of assume that uh, there's a Go proxy in between, potentially a malicious Go proxy in between. So you can still do detection there. Um, another example, Puppy Rat. Uh, this one's a, uh, you know, it's a, a, a open source uh, pen testing tool. Uh, it was, uh, you know, like with most uh, open source pen testing tools, it will eventually get used for evil. Uh, so, you know, Iranians use Puppy Rat to uh, hit Middle Eastern organizations, at least according to SecureWorks. Uh, and then SecureWorks released some IOCs, which included domains and whatnot. Um, and, you know, those IOCs are not always the most valuable because they're usually burned by the time they're, they're published. Uh, however, the fact that they were using Puppy Rat uh, is good for us because then we can look to see if we can build detection for that. And it turns out that detection is really easy. So uh, they hard code. Uh, the order in which the ciphers are uh, are picked for the client hello. So this is what it looks like. Um, and there's the job three. And it's, uh, yeah, so detection is actually pretty simple for Puppy Rat, turns out. And there's actually, I think there's an, a bug in their code where uh, you can see a cipher suite in the middle is unknown. I think that's like a semicolon or something. So it just makes it super anomalous, very easy to detect. I'll move on to some targeted malware. Um, so uh, this is malware that was specifically targeted for our environment, you know, by some pen testers, uh, and it turned out it was really easy to detect using JAW3 because it only had a single cipher. Uh, very anomalous, uh, very easy to find just by hunting for some weird things. Um, I should mention that our, our bro script, uh, if you uncomment some lines, uh, you can uh, have it log the entire fingerprint string along with the JAW3. Uh, so you can do some hunting based on looking for something like only one certificate. Uh, so back to Metasploit, round four. Let's go back at it. Uh, I ran uh, Metasploit on a, on a Windows VM just to get some more details. This is what it looked like in Moloch, by the way. If you don't know what Moloch is, it's this awesome full packet capture, open source tool. Find out more at molo.ch. Anyways, this is what it looked like in Moloch. Uh, Moloch has JAW3 uh, built into it, the latest version. Um, so we could see that the job three wasn't changing every time we were running um, Interpreter on Windows 10. And uh, and this was the job three for direct to an IP, and the bottom was the job three if it was going to like a domain name. Uh, and so looking for that in, uh, in an example environment, uh, find out that that happens quite often, that job three pops up quite a bit. And uh, that's because it's actually like a Windows DLL API, so it's a Windows API that it's communicating through. Um, so detection just based on that doesn't really work very well. Uh, enter JAW3S. This is where we deviate from Lee Brotherston's research, uh, starting to look at fingerprinting the server side of the Hello Packet. Um, so this was my hypothesis in building this, because uh, even Lee Brotherston in his talk was like, don't bother fingerprinting the server side. There's nothing, there's nothing of value there. It changes too often. But I, I did it anyways, just to see. Because I had an idea that... Um, Clients will, uh, or, or servers will respond to different clients differently, but they'll respond to the same client the same. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So in this example, um, you know, client sends a hello packet to a server, all A's. Server's like, oh, hello, A, let's talk A. Now, different client going to the same server sends a hello packet, all B's. So that's same server, says hello, B, let's talk B, right? Um, so, you know, different client responding differently. However, it'll keep responding the same to that B client. Um, so here's the method that we use for generating that JAW3S. We just look at the TLS version that the server is using, the Cypher suite that it picked, and then the list of extensions. It's actually just really simple. So, again, this is what it looks like. We MD5 hash that, uh, and, uh, and that's how we get the JAW3S. Now, um, I have an example here. Uh, so I connected to the same server multiple times over with different clients, JAW3 on the left, JAW3S on the right. Um, so uh, first client connected to it four times over, server responds the exact same way to that client four times over. Different client, server responds the exact same way four times over, right? So it, it, it works. Uh, so what can we tell from that? Um, some examples, TrickBot malware. Uh, there's a JAW3 and JAW3S. The TrickBot uh, command and control servers respond always the same to the TrickBot client, never changes. Uh, same with ICE ID. Um, 
the Tor client, again, the Tor servers respond exactly the same to the Tor client. Um, and uh, it's been open sourced. It's on the same GitHub. If you do a bro package install Jaw3, you also get Jaw3s built in. Um, so back to Metasploit, round five, let's do this. Uh, this is the Jaw3s for uh, Metasploit running on Kali. This is how um, Interpreter responds uh, running on Kali. And, um, and if we look at that in our example environment, there are some hits, so this by itself is not a good indicator. However, if we combine it with the Jaw3, the client, right, which is uh, uh, that Windows API that it's communicating through, and the way that Kali responds to it, no hits in an environment of, you know, uh, tens of thousands of systems, uh, so no false positives. Uh, it, that's it. That's the detection mechanism. And so they can change the certificate all they want. They can change how they build the certificate. This will still work. Um, another example, Cobalt Strikes Beacon. Um, it tends to use the uh, the same API that Metasploit's using, um, but the server responds slightly differently. Uh, however, the same and and this is interesting, the way that it responds, it uh, uses renegotiation info and uh, extended master secret as extensions, but extended master secret, they're both basically empty. So the, I don't know why the extensions are there, however they are, and it's anomalous, so detection is also uh, super easy. Uh, and then that, that's it. Um, yeah, it's just simple low false positive detection. You could do the JAW3 of direct to an IP and then the JAW3 uh, where it's going to a domain because those will produce two different fingerprints. Um, and then and the JAW3S equals the, uh, the, in this instance, the Kali server, this latest version of Kali. Uh, let's dive into Empire over Python. Um, so this, this example is again with pen testers. Um, and, uh, and so they were using the Python version of Empire. Uh, so the JAW3 there is the JAW3 for Python. You know, if I look for that in our environment, um, and I, I forgot to take a screenshot of it, but I swear this is what it looked like in Splunk. Um, there was a lot, right? Because it's Python. Um, and there's a lot of Python, you know, happening in a dev environment. However, if we look at the JAW3S, it turned out that their server was responding in a very unique way to this, uh, this, you know, uh, Python Empire uh, uh, malware. So if I search for Jaw3 equals Python and Jaw3s equals their C2, the way that their C2 was responding, um, then all I saw was just the connections from the infected hosts. And that was it. That was the, that was the detection mechanism. So it, it worked out really well. Um, of course, we had other detection mechanisms on the hosts and whatnot, but for, for the network detection, uh, this worked out really well. So they actually, um, they, they actually, after this, after detection, you know, iterating through normal, you know, kind of pen test style stuff, uh, uh, they changed their, uh, certificate. They went out and bought a brand new certificate. They had it signed. They bought a new domain, you know, re, redid the whole thing, got another shell on network. Boom, detection. And they're like, oh, well, let's, let's move. So they moved to a completely new infrastructure. Um, you know, a, a new cloud hosting provider. They bought more servers. They, you know, they moved their, their image over and everything like that, bought a new domain, new certificate. Um, and then as soon as they got their first shell, boom, detection, instantaneous. They were demoralized. <laughs> because, you know, what, like who thinks like in order to evade detection, I have to change my server image? Uh, no one really thinks about that, but that's what would have been needed in order to evade this or, um, uh, or just not use TLS, uh, because then it doesn't work. Um, so uh, that takes me to hash. So fingerprinting uh, TLS, SSL, uh, that's not the only thing that we can fingerprint that's an encrypted channel. Turns out that we can also fingerprint SSH. So this idea and concept uh, was created by Ben Reardon um, on our team. And what he came up with was that uh, we could use these fields and the SSH uh, key negotiation to fingerprint uh, SSH clients and servers. Uh, so we use the KEX algorithm, the encrypted algorithms, the MAC algorithms, and the compression algorithms. Um, and just to give an example, I've got two different clients up here, but between the two clients, one will have zlib none and the other one will have none zlib. So just the way that they're ordering 
very simple things uh, can be very unique. So the way that uh, the method for fingerprinting uh, SSH clients and servers that we came up with that uh, tends to just be simple and work is we take the key exchange, uh, we use a semicolon delimiter, uh, then encryption, uh, message off, compression, and then we take all that, we MD5 hash it to a nice, easy, shareable 32 character fingerprint. Um, and, uh, and the reason why we MD5 hash again, we were looking at doing SHA-256, but it just didn't make sense because we're not worried about hash collisions when all we have is just the string of text. Um, and also it's unnecessarily long, uh, so we can, we can tweet these fingerprints a lot easier, I guess. Uh, an another reason why we don't want to just output the entire uh, uh, field, because this is what it would look like um, normally, so just nice and easy 32-character fingerprint. Um, hash has been open sourced. Uh, that's the link for it. Um, and there's a nice blog post on the Salesforce engineering site. Um, and again, the, the whole idea was basically created by Ben Reardon um, and Adele, myself, and Jeff, we, we just kind of helped out in, uh, in building it. So uh, there's going to be a lot of cool research coming out of coming from this from uh, both Ben and Adele. So I recommend you guys follow them on Twitter uh, to see what's coming out next. Uh, something to note here, though, is this is really powerful for honeypots uh, because you can uh, correlate threat actors as they're scanning the internet, changing. You know, they could say like, uh, "I'm Open SSH version 7.6," but are they really? I mean, you would be able to tell. And they could change, like, uh, now I'm a Cisco uh, uh, SSH client and whatever, and keep changing. And you would be able to tell just by the fingerprint, because the fingerprint won't change. Uh, same thing can be done on the other side. So this can also be used for, uh, for fingerprinting um, honeypots. So if you had a honeypot and you said, you know, I'm a Cisco switch or something like that, but the fingerprint shows that you're just running open SSH, then probably a honeypot. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, just be aware of that. Um, but yeah, it's it's awesome. So uh, keep an eye on those uh, uh, those uh, Twitter accounts. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say Jaw three is not a silver bullet. Uh, appli application collisions can happen. What I mean by that is that multiple applications can end up having the same Jaw 3 for whatever reason. They were just built the same way, same process or whatever. Uh, and applications can connect through OS APIs. Uh, so, you know, just be aware of that. And there can be up to five Jaw 3s for the same application. Um, so if you remember uh, earlier in the talk, uh, there was a lot of different Chrome uh, Jaw 3s, and that's because there will be one for if it's direct to an IP, one if it's uh, going to a domain, another one if it's a renegotiation, uh, and so on. So, uh, however, malware just tends to have one, so that's that's nice. Uh, it's always valuable as a pivot point for analysis. So there's no reason not to run it. Uh, there's no reason not to look at it if you're beginning an investigation. It's just, uh, it's always valuable. Uh, Jaw 3 is a silver bullet sometimes. Um, each environment is different, but like in that other example with the, uh, the malware that was developed and targeted specifically for us, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. So, uh, and then combined with uh, JAW 3S uh, allows for fingerprinting of the entire TLS communication, um, which is, can be like super valuable for detection, uh, especially for you know, specific threat actors that you might be worried about or seeing in your environment. Um, and this style of fingerprinting can work across other encrypted channels. Ben Reardon came up with the method for, um, for fingerprinting SSH, and I'm sure that if there's another encrypted channel that you're thinking about, you can probably apply the same idea to that. So uh, uh, please take this, use it, build off of it, um, build off of our research, make it better. Three years ago, uh, you know, three, three years ago, Lee Brotherston stood up here at DerbyCon and, and he was like, you know, talking about fingerprint TLS and all the research that just got us so excited. Um, and, and at the end of his talk, he was like, just, you know, go and, and, uh, and build upon this, you know, make it better. And I want to, I want to say the same here. Like, uh, if, if you're seeing this and you got more ideas on how to make it better, please, uh, do it, you know, fork our repo, create something new. Um, and so you might be thinking, this is awesome. Uh, I, I like it. Can, can I have it? And um, actually, if you're running 
some of these, you might actually already have it. So Moloch already supports JAW3. Uh, ExtraHop just implemented it. Uh, Darktrace is running it, Gray Noise. Uh, Suricata will be in the latest version. Um, and a lot of other companies are, are running it as well. So there's an Nginx module and, and so on. So uh, there's actually a, a quite, a, quite a bit of support out there already. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to give a shout out to some people who have uh, helped me out, uh, mentored me technically. Um, so I uh, just want to say thank you to these guys. If it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be up here because I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So thanks, thanks to them. And, uh, and again, my name's John Altaus. I do threat detection. Um, you can contact me at my email address or the Twitter link. And, and again, the code's all been open source. It's on uh, GitHub. So yeah. Is there, uh, is there any questions I can answer? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, so, so the question is, the question is, why were there so many um, different hashes for Google Chrome in that example for this laptop? And that's because, like I said, um, there could be multiple uh, JAW threes for different things. So, like, if Chrome is renegotiation, reading negotiating to an existing connection. It'll have different uh, extensions and whatnot. Um, so that'll create a new JAW3. And then if it's uh, communicating direct to an IP or to a domain, that'll create two different JAW3s. So, um, so there can be quite a bit for especially browsers. But for other applications, there could be only one. Um, like malware tends to just have one. Tor just has one, for example. Yeah, uh, yes. Why is there so So, yeah. So the the question is, why is there so much variance? Why is each application kind of unique? And the answer is because it it depends on you know what libraries you have installed on your build system at the time that you're building. Even the the operating system and the version of the operating system uh, matters in how the TLS uh, uh, client hello is formulated. So you know the way that that you build an application right now. Um, like on your laptop will be very different from the way like Google's building their master Chrome, you know, client, uh, on their server somewhere using different libraries, different operating systems. And that, that's how, that's why it's all unique. Yes. So, uh, so let me answer the first part. So the, the question was, how do we build our library? And, um, and we basically use a complicated um, a method in Splunk of combining uh, fields. So, uh, so we get it from the host logs, and then the network logs combine them together, and we build out like a list that way. Uh, what was your second? Yeah. Yo. Oh, absolutely. So, so the question was, what if, uh, what if I create a whole bunch of uh, signatures for malware? Like, how would I share that and whatnot? Um, so we didn't create a blacklist because we're worried that you know what may work in our environment may not work in other environments. There may be false positives. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you want to create a blacklist and share it out, please do. You can, you can add to our repo or you can create your own repo. Let me know. I'll add a link in our repo to link to your repo and then everyone will see and we can do it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. And that's going to change my client handshake as well. So, you know, there could be even more fingerprints just because of um, admin-based 
Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the comment is, is that there could be um, a, a lot more variance based on what admins are doing in your environment, whether they're changing what Cypher suites could be in your operating system. And, and absolutely, that's why I say, and, and why we don't really want to build a, a blacklist is because what may work in our environment may not work in yours, because in doing so, they could create some collisions with like a blacklist. So uh, it's all of this really environment specific, um, but it also can work Unbelievably well. Yes. The other thing, building on that, it, it, it doesn't matter. You can, you can make your own devices look like the same way long as you can just against the wire and you're going to have a lot of stuff. You're always going to be outliers because you just have to. Yes. Yeah. So the comment is, is this, no matter what, this will give you the outliers in any kind of environment. And, and absolutely, one of the things that, that the pen testing team, after we detected them and we talked with them about everything, and they, they told us how demoralized they were. And, um, <laughs> they, they, one of the first things that they thought of, and this is a common thing, what other people are thinking, is that, well, I'll just build into my application some randomness, so it'll randomize my Cypher suites every time it connects and, and whatnot. However, like that would actually make them even easier to detect. Because in my example where I showed this laptop, there's, there was something like uh, 18 um, JAW 3s for, for my laptop over a period of time. And so if they're randomizing every time it connects, well then they're gonna have like 100 or 200. And that, that client, you know, that, that machine would stick out like a sore thumb and be even easier to detect. It, exactly. However, well, it, so it de then it depends on how the server responds because, so the comment was is that, uh, well, if you go through the OS API, uh, that's true, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the comment was if, if you just go through the OS API, then, uh, then it'll make detection a lot harder. However, you know, in the example that we had, uh, they were using uh, Python, and so the Java 3 was Python, but um, because of the unique way that their server was responding to it, it was very anomalous. So, uh, But then if they use a standard server, maybe that would get around that, and maybe that's the, the one way, I don't know. Yes? Did you try to do any of this through a mailbox that does like get less reception or anything like that? Uh, why do you, what do you mean? Why do you uh, ask? Like you had uh, something that would terminate TLS um, between the client Yeah. So, yeah. So I kind I kind of mentioned that with that with that other proxy was that uh, the JAW three will be of the proxy, um, but the uh, it depends on how that proxy is configured. If it would pass the uh, the uh, the user agent through, and everything else would be the same besides the TLS communication yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It still can be useful, um, or it could not. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends. It, it, it depends. But uh, yeah, any other questions? Yes. It, so the the question was, how long did it take us to uh, to compare Jaw three and Jaw three S and find anomalies? Um, and the answer is not long at all, at least not in Splunk. It was uh, very quick and easy uh, to just, you know, find something weird, click on the JAW 3, and I'd see a whole bunch of results for that JAW 3, and then i click on the JAW 3S of the thing that could be malicious, and then i just see just that traffic. Um, and, like, that process takes, like, 45 seconds, so, like, the analysis is fast. Yes, in the back. The question is, can I fingerprint SSHing to a VPN? Oh, I see what you're saying. So if you SSH into some like uh, VPN or some jump host and then SSH from that into something else, can I fingerprint the original one? The answer is no. Um, the, uh, it'd only be fingerprinting just the, the client that is making the connection from where I can see it.
Anyone else? Yes? So the question is, have I done any fingerprinting of common VPNs? And um, I haven't really spent much time on it. Um, do a lot more fingerprinting with um, with the well. Maybe this was your question with the with VPNs like Tor, like ways of of hiding your traffic. Yeah, we do we do uh, research that, and we have a list for those um, to find any of that traffic originating from within our network. So. Yeah, and then ISPs could probably do the same, but please don't. <laughs> uh, anyone else? All right, thank you.